Um, our speaker tonight is uh, Dan Linder and Lindner. Right? That's me. Yep. Yep. Uh, and he's a research mycology at the U.S. Forest Services Center for Forest Mycology Research. And he's been doing this since 2008, which means you've got a lot of great stories to tell. I guess. But I will turn it over to you because I could say more, but you are a star on your own. Uh, thank you. And hopefully you can hear me and you can see the screen that I'm sharing. Okay, and I'm going to minimize this. And I do have other stories to tell. And so I'm hoping that you guys will invite me back once we can do this in person. Um, okay, it's a little disconcerting to get rid of all of the faces. But I am excited to be able to do this under these circumstances um, as we all <laughs> do our part, shelter in place, um, but still want to hear about mushrooms, um, hear some of these stories uh, as much as I would much rather be <laughs> with uh, the people of the society there in Illinois, uh, going out for dinner, going out for a beer afterwards. Um, but we will do that at some point. And for tonight, this was kind of a request of Brit uh, wanting to learn about rot and decay. And, um, and as I started to put the pieces of the puzzle together, I realized I've tried to put a lot into this presentation. Um, so we'll see if I've jammed too many things together. Uh, but Luckily, also, if it runs a little bit long, what else do we have to do? So, um, although I will ask, we don't get cut off at a certain time, like the Zoom. Okay, good. You're shaking your hand. Okay, good. Um, I will try not to go over four or five hours or so. Um, and I'm just joking because I usually try and keep it to 45 minutes, but I think this is going to run a little bit long, um, mainly because I also, based on the time of year, I just wanted to show some nice pictures of forests and places where we would like to go this time of year, um, because this is what drew me into mycology. Looking at a forest like this, this is actually Phoebe, a research plot um, near Stockholm, Sweden, that I worked in. And for me, and most of us, as someone who loves fungi, I look at a picture like this and I see fungi everywhere. I don't see the trees and rocks. I imagine stripping away all the trees, stripping away all the rocks, um, and that you could still see the outline of every single needle on every tree because of all of the endophytic fungi living inside the trees, all of the decay fungi, all of the lichens on the bark. And of course, as you look down at your feet, all of the wonderful mushrooms out there, uh, species that I would call Cantharellus infundibuliformis, but I hate to even go into the taxonomy of things in this group, um, but commonly known as a yellow-footed chanterelle, a good thing to be eating this time of year. It's really high in vitamin D. And the other thing that, so I truly got drawn into mycology because I loved collecting for fungi that you could eat, but I was intrigued by fungi in all sorts of ways. One of the questions that I always had when I saw a fungus like this um, was, what is it doing? So it's there in the moss, um, but what, what's its ecology? How does it make a living? And in general, even though I'm going to be talking about decay and rot tonight, I'm starting out with these sort of three broad main ecological groups just to remind us generally of what fungi do. And there's blurring between these different things, but um, in general, there's the root-associated fungi, mycorrhizal fungi, there's parasitic pathogenic fungi, and then decay fungi. And because, again, to see some nice pictures of mushrooms reminding us what mycorrhizal fungi are, they're these beneficial fungi that grow on tree roots um, with the fruiting bodies there shown above and then below some of what the, um, these are ectomycorrhizal fungi. So this is showing the actual root tips where the fungus has colonized the root tips. And fungi such as this, um, from a, a geological perspective, these fungi um, were likely critical for the colonization of land environments by plant or plant-like organisms. Um, this concept of moving from wet to dry environments and how fungi can help 
sheath uh, organisms and help them maintain so that they don't lose so much water. And a close up of those, just showing what some of the mycorrhizal root tips look like. Um, these things that we tend to focus on the fruiting bodies up above, but that's what you find in the soil down below are things like Dermosabi or Cortinarius semisanguineus, uh, known for its dyeing properties for dyeing fabrics. Um, of pretty pictures of fungi, things that, so Porcini, other mycorrhizal fungi, um, while we're desperately waiting for some fungi to come out, um, which as Bryn Dentinger at one point told me the name of these, uh, not edgeless, but something close to it. These are the ones with pine in Northern Wisconsin, but we have with the spruce, the closer to true edgeless. Um, but you'll note that I've just taken the, the weak way out and put CF um, in between, before most of my species names, um, which I didn't even do with this, hidden or pandem, just remembering, remembering all these fun things we can find in the forest, gild, toothed fungi, like hedgehog mushrooms, and then of course, working my way towards Morcella. This time of year, having to give a plug for, it won't be long, um, actually I don't know, I saw reports from Georgia that they were out, but talking about root associated fungi, that Morcella is an interesting group ranging from things that may be actually potentially mycorrhizal based on some of Tom Volk's work and Marsha Harbin, was it? Um, uh, all the way to species that seem to be able to grow and fruit completely in the absence of a plant host. So we put things in these boxes, these ecological boxes, but there's a lot more um, complexity and often things go along a continuum as we learn how many different Morcella, Morcella morel species we have in North America. We're just beginning to sort out their ecology and which ones may be really plant associated. Parasitic fungi. I thought this was particularly appropriate. I wanted to talk about this a little bit more given the current context because we often think of fungi as diseases, agents of disease, while we're of course dealing with a, a viral pandemic. Um, and fungi do cause many diseases. I'm a plant pathologist by training. Um, they cause many diseases of plants, insects, reptiles, and amphibians, but only rarely mammals. That being said, I also studied white nose syndrome of bats but they're very unusual mammals, they hibernate. The key between all of those things where fungi are major uh, agents of disease is that uh, most of them tend to be cold-blooded or endothermic or they're, they are not regulating their own temperature. And there's this question of whether uh, there's the evolution of warm-bloodedness, endothermy, was to escape fungal pathogens, um, to escape all of this pressure. And if you do want to go down that rabbit hole, it's an interesting, um, the fact that humans pretty much, we have very few fungal diseases, um, although with a larger population of immunocompromised people, um, uh, organ transplants, of course, we're having more and more uh, fungal diseases, but for the most part, we deal with bacteria and we deal with viruses as our major things that cause disease. Arturo Casadevall is one of the people who has studied this or looked into it looking at whether um, fungal, well so for this first one, whether fungal virulence and vertebrate endothermy is connected to dinosaur extinction. Is there a connection? He came up with a paper that had more data, um, but I would say it's interesting to note that he really focused on um, the fungi that you can find in culture collections from North temperate regions, we don't know much about tropical fungi. So trying to put this story together without really looking at tropical fungi, I think is missing a lot. And they did some modeling work later that is interesting to show that the trade-off between the costs of having this higher metabolic rate to be warm blooded versus um, the benefit gained because you could escape fungi um, based on their calculations came out to be almost exactly human body temperature. So for everybody who's measuring their body temperature twice a day, um, they uh, estimated the optimum was somewhere around 36.7 degrees with human body temperature being about 37 degrees Celsius. Um, so this interesting idea that there may be some connections there. So in terms of fungi, for the most part, they're parasites of things like plants. Almost every plant leaf that you turn over has 
little fungal structures on this, this little black dots are claystathesia, uh, uh, powdery mildew of some sort that if you look at it with microscope is beautiful. But in terms of quote unquote, cold blooded things, fungi are everywhere. Like the spider in Belize being completely colonized um, by an asexual stage of a fungus covered with this pink fungus. This is actually a picture of a, um, a fly from Belize. And this is what makes me, I'm always thankful for my warm bloodedness. We may get some fungal diseases, but we tend not to sprout horns. So if you don't know what you're looking at, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, you probably can't. Um, the shriveled eyes of the fly, think of sort of a domestic housefly, are looking at you and where its wings would be, it's got two um, large eight sexual fruiting structures that have burst out of where its wings would be. It's got fun asexual fungal horns coming out of its behind and it's got a asexual fungal horn growing directly out of its face. So if you're not warm blooded, fungi can really take you over and colonize you quite well. Um, other examples, of course, are fungi growing on other fungi. Um, whether or not this is Asterophora growing on a, a Russula species, but whether or not these are truly parasitic, fungi grow on other fungi, they grow on plants. Um, but it's relatively rare that they grow on mammals. So. That being said, then getting to the meat of what we're going to talk about, decay fungi. Um, sorry, still getting used to these controls, but I'll say, start with the general statement of that fungi are the only organisms capable of efficiently breaking down wood or woody tissue. And thank you to Patrick Leacock for making me put in that asterisk um, and then adding this to it, a great reference for people who want to look into uh, all of these other, which really it comes down to a number of bacterial lineages that have figured out how to tunnel into wood that have the genes to break down uh, lignin. Um, and yet at the end of the day, I'll still fall back on, I'm going to use some really generalized statements of the vast majority of wood in the ecosystems is broken down um, by fungi. And uh, where these other things like bacteria tend to come into play are in very extreme environments, like literally Antarctica um, or hypersaline lakes or the bottom of Lake Superior, where the wood that uh, sunk to the bottom, that Bob Blanchett and others looked at that sunk to the bottom of Lake Superior, the things that were colonizing the wood at the bottom of Lake Superior where there was no oxygen and it was cold, um, there still are things breaking down wood, um, but those uh, non, like the tunneling bacteria and some of the strange groups of fungi, um, they tend to be in those extreme environments. So that leads me to some nice pictures of decay fungi, things like Latoporus. This is something that I work with the taxonomy of, um, known as chicken of the woods or sulfur shell but a good brown rot species. And I'm leaving it at porous species because um, it is, because I work with it, I know that it's likely uh, the taxonomy of all of these things change. And um, if we can ever get our act together and <laughs> stop dealing with pandemics and stop dealing with uh, bureaucracy, publish some papers showing that it looks like uh, Latoporus sulfurius sensu stricto um, is restricted to Europe and trying to uh, finally get some good names on all of our North American species of Latoporus, um, of which there, there are still at least a good five or six more to name in North America and worldwide plenty when this was all known as Latoporus sulfurius um, in the broadest possible sense globally not that long ago. Other decay fungi, uh, white rots like herisium. And as an, an amateur and interest, someone who was interested in what you could eat and edible fungi, these were the fungi that I tend to focus on early on in my, uh, you know, as I was beginning to know fungi. And then I fell in love with the really, the true stars of the mycological world, crust fungi. 
they're not lichens. You have to turn over logs to find them. Um, but they're often just flat and white like the one more on top, that's Hypoderma puberum. But this beautiful one with the red and the yellow margin, Flebia coccinea fulva, is actually considered um, a red-listed species in Europe. We do find it in parts of North America. And there are thousands of species of crust fungi. Um, they're very, I personally love them because they also ecologically um, are doing the, a huge amount of the work in terms of decomposing wood. They tend to be obscured. They don't necessarily show up on our, our foray lists all of the time. Um, but from an ecological standpoint, when you start going into wood and looking at it, especially with DNA, crust fungi and these more obscure fungi um, are some of the ones really doing the bulk of the, the ecological work in terms of decomposing wood, as well as uh, this is a picture of a flat resupinate polypore. This is an Antrodia species. Um, kind of yellow and with these beautiful, I actually don't even know if they're, um, I'm going to call them uh, millipedes until someone tells me otherwise, but this is a picture from Idaho showing you um, that a lot of these decay fungi, they're not particularly pretty. I think of that one as pretty because it's got some yellow tones, um, but they're not as pr pretty as Herisium or, or Chicken of the Woods. So wood decay, and rot is hot, why, why really care about wood decay? And a lot of it from an ecological standpoint, for me, the reasons I got interested in it is that wood decay is incredibly important because a large portion of terrestrial carbon is locked up in wood. Um, I, again, my using COVID as an excuse, um, my goal was to look up more recent figures. A lot of these slides go back to 2017 and some of these numbers haven't been updated, but say approximately 86% of above ground carbon is in forests and most of that is locked up in trees. But you're talking about um, a gigaton means pretty much nothing to me and so I assume to most other people. Um, but what it comes down to is there's a lot of carbon in wood. So if you care about carbon, uh, you care about where it's going. And the type of rot, I'll break it down into sort of three, I'll come back to this, I'll talk about it in more detail, but in general I'm going to talk about white rots, brown rots, and soft rots. And you can sometimes observe in the wood directly attached to the fruiting body what type of rot you're dealing with. I would say that's not a great, um, it's not perfect. And typically when we are trying to look at it more closely, to determine rot type with certainty, you usually have to culture it and then grow it either on test blocks or specialized media. It looks something like this where we grow test blocks a lot of the time in our lab. And then you analyze the type of rot that it um, produces and you can get a much better, because in a natural piece of wood, often there's hundreds of species competing and growing together and trying to figure out what type of decay an individual species is producing is very difficult. And so trying to go through and getting a, a better care, better information about what each of these different species, um, ecologically, how they break down wood. And so in terms of types of wood decay, again, I'll go with some broad, terms here. When I learned it, say it would have been soft rot, and they would have said that was caused by ascomycetes, and it's generally slow rot. And then there's the white rots and the brown rots, and that tend to be by basidiomycetes, and those tend to be faster. And the only thing nice about that is that it's a relatively simple explanation. Um, but it Humans love to put things in bins and white rot and brown rot are not particularly good bins. Um, this brings up the concept of say gray rot, which I'm not going to go there so much tonight only because I already realized that I had 60 slides. Um, so, but for anybody who wants to go down that rabbit hole, a great place to start is with this, this uh, paper, uh, 2014, um, Extensive sampling of basidiomycete genomes demonstrates the inadequacy of white rot, brown rot paradigm. You can't just easily put things in those two um, bins as much as uh, we tend to do this. And this is work by Dan Cullen, who also works for the Forest Service in the same, uh, not the same unit, but more or less the same building I'm in. David Hibbett, Igor Gregoriev, uh, uh, Francis Martin, Dimitri Flautist, many of these groups that have been looking at genomes of wood decay fungi and trying to figure out what they do, going above and beyond what we did 
60, 70 years ago, which was take a hatchet, hack in behind the fruiting body and just try and look at the wood behind the fruiting body and hope that that told you something about the decay it was producing. So I'm, for the most part, going to keep it like this, to keep it simple, um, to talk, because in some ways these big bins they still sort of work of soft rot, white rot, and brown rot in terms of ecologically, what does it matter and why would someone care? And so for soft rot, these are things that maybe say in the order Xylariales, trying to think of genera that people would have heard of that show up again on foray lists frequently, Xylaria and Deldinia, um, dead men's fingers and carbon balls. Um, they're, they are, they would be considered soft rots, but I'm actually calling them out because they're proficient wood decayers. Um, they are technically classified as soft rots, but especially in small diameter debris, especially in parts of, of the tropics, member of, of the Xyleriaceae are insanely important in decaying wood, but we know very little about it because a lot of this mycology in terms of wood decomposition has been done in North temperate regions, um, focusing on North America and Europe. And some of these members, del uh, isolate of Deldinia concentrica, uh, the carbon ball fungus that we have, can easily produce 25% mass loss in a wooden block in a matter of weeks. They're, they're really good at what they do. So just because something's called a soft rot, um, now that is maybe somewhat the exception. Most of the soft rots tend to be very slow. But so Xylaria, things like, um, again, Deadman's Fingers uh, starts out black, the younger ones, or, or matures black, starts out with these powdery white canidia and stealing a slide from Tom Folk to show uh, dead men's fingers and why we call it dead men's fingers with one in section. And how in the lower right corner, you can see a section of the parathesia where they produce their spores. But if you were to cut one, that upper right picture is if you were to cut a dead men's fingers, um, you can see the inner stroma is mostly white and those little black sacs all the way around are where they're producing their spores. Carbon balls are another group that would fall into this. Uh, Deldinia concentrica, one of these that when you cut it, you see these those beautiful concentric rings, again, parathesial. So then jumping to brown rot and white rot, because again, I'm going to say ecologically, that's where most, that's where, you know, you're getting most of the action, most of your numbers, most of your percentages in terms of where the carbon is flowing. And so where I'll make this broad statement of brown rot and white rot being the major types of wood decay um, in most terrestrial systems. And there are fewer species that produce brown rots than white rots. About, as far as we know so far, about 10% of decay species are brown rotters. And white rot in general tends to return most of the carbon quickly to the atmosphere, and I'll explain why in a bit. And brown rots funnel carbon, or at least it's believed, and this is part of my active research trying to document this, what we really tracing carbon in wood as it decomposes using isotopically labeled wood, um, and a number of different experiments that we have going on, really trying to look at the flow of wood into the soil and how long it stays there. But there's been this general idea that brown rots create slow, stable carbon, but not a lot of data to back that up. And it would be really nice as modeling efforts become more and more intense, more and more um, nuanced, to be able to uh, quantify within different ecosystems how much decay is flowing down a white rot path versus how much decay is flowing down into a brown rot path, because that could have profound implications for how long the carbon stays in the system as a sink versus how quickly it goes to the atmosphere. And the ability to produce a brown rot has evolved multiple times from white rot ancestors early on because brown rots were typically often associated with conifers. People thought that brown rots um, actually were sort of the first things to evolve and white rot came later. They thought brown rots are simple. They can't even break down lignin. They're not very good at what they do. Um, and it seems to be just the reverse that, um, but as I noted with that gray rot paper, uh, different forms of white rot have, and, and brown rot have evolved many different times. So in terms of how it works, wood is really made up of two things. Again, this is painting with an incredibly broad uh, brush. 
Cellulose, which is white, that's the stuff that we want in our paper. And it's got lignin on a brown paper bag. We haven't gone to the trouble to get rid of the lignin because we didn't care if the paper stayed brown. So it takes less energy to leave the lignin behind. Um, so in cheap paper and cardboard, we leave the lignin behind and it's brown. In high quality paper, uh, we often want the cellulose. There are of course other hemicelluloses and sugars and other things in wood. Um, but in a really simple way, you can think of it as this cellulose, the white component, and lignin, the brown. And lignin being kind of the protective structure around the cellulose, because cellulose is really where all the energy is stored. Breaking down lignin is incredibly energy expensive relative to what you get. Cellulose is their, literally their sugar. That's their food. That's what they're breaking down and turning into sugar. That's what everybody out there in the ecosystem wants. Um, but it's protected behind this sort of iron gate of, of lignin. So fungi have to figure out how to get past the lignin to get to the cellulose. White rots um, can, for the most part, usually break down lignin entirely. They attack the lignin, and it's very hard to do. They, um, I won't go there, but they figured out ways to break it down, and then um, they can get at the cellulose and sometimes leave some of the cellulose behind and that's why the rot looks white compared to a brown rot where they just modify the lignin and, but can still, because they're clever, figure out without destroying it, the, but can still, they just modify it enough so that they can eat the cellulose, they can get at the cellulose and what's left behind appears brown. So again, to recap, in a white rot, the lignin is generally destroyed and you leave this white cellulose behind. Um, and that is what chemically we tend to do in the paper making process. In brown rot, it, they, these fungi modify the lignin and most of the lignin is left behind and they decompose the cellulose. And so you wind up with this uh, uh, generally brown cubicle brown rot. So fungi are exciting, wonderful organisms that have evolved um, the ability to break down wood. So, but they can do this, that's great. But how is this connected to, you know, so they're connected to carbon cycling and geological processes. Um, but uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, how did people figure out that this happened and what was going on and what are some of the larger implications? And the problem with the fossil record is that very few fungi have been preserved in the fossil record. Almost all of them tend to be microscopic. Um, 738. Okay, also checking my time. So the, you know, Devonian, Devonian uh, the Rhine chert is a classic example that was very well preserved of root material where some of examples where fungal material was seen. Um, or this looks like an alternaria spore from the lost Chicken Creek um, deposits. But for the most part, a lot of the fossil fungi that we know are microscopic. I'm going to focus on, well, that is important I'm, because um, I love, I think it's interesting to focus on what are some of the mushrooms that were actually preserved. Um, going back again to, I think, 2017, I was saying only five fossil guild mushrooms were known, and the oldest was at 90 to 94 million years old. And how were they preserved? These were the um, in amber. So amber was when it happened, of course, this was incredibly rare, um, but you've got examples of just exquisite preservation of gild fungi in amber. This goes back to a Hibbit 2003 paper where you could see the preservation was so beautiful, you could see the basidiospores in the amber and still measure their size and see their shape. Another example, another gorgeous picture, this Protomycena electra, um, 15 to 30 million years old. Um, so there aren't that many of them. And going back, say, to 100 million years, but then I have to say in 2017, um, going into late 2017, I think when they finished cleaning up the name, Andy Miller, Andy Methvin, others at the Illinois Natural History uh, Survey found the first compression fossil of a mushroom that pushed back the dates. It pushed it to 120 million years old from the laminated limestone of um, the Crato Formation in Brazil. 
sorry, having some trouble with advancing. Okay, there. And the fossil, I don't, maybe actually by this point it already has been, was to be repatriated to Brazil. I don't know how long it spent in um, Illinois or where it was, but it was named uh, Gondwana Agaricocytes. Agaricocytes. Oh, I tried to practice this. Gondwana Agaricocytes Magnificus. Um, and this is the picture of it. And if you use your imagination, and since if Andy Miller and all the other authors are out there listening, um, I'll try and be kind and say, yep, if you use your imagination, I guess it looks like a mushroom. I at least like to uh, uh, jibe Andy Miller that um, to me, you really have to use your imagination to believe that this is a mushroom fossil, but they've got lots of supporting evidence on uh, to show you know, these gill fragments, different parts of it, um, where the gills are still almost in line here. But obviously the preservation isn't nearly as complete as you see in amber. And ephemeral, um, you know, fruiting bodies like mushrooms are going to be incredibly rare in the fossil record. So if you want to go and figure out, well, and then, okay, in a quick tour through, if you're going to toss, talk about fossil fungi, um, you have to mention prototaxites in terms of the strange and the wonderful, going back to being named in 1859, Prototaxites has been argued to be just about everything you can imagine. And some of these pictures show the scale of it, um, that it's up to eight meters long and up to a meter wide. Uh, and it's been argued to be everything from a fungus to an alga, to a plant, to a lichen. Um, and this thing appears to have lived from about 420 to 370 million years ago artist conceptualization, although others have come up with other ideas of what it potentially looked like, but it appears like it was certainly taller than anything else at the time. Again, a lot of debate every, this goes back to 2007, every, where there was a carbon isotope analysis to look at prototaxites pretty much just to show that it wasn't a plant. It was a heterotroph. It appears to, based on its isotopic signature, seem to have been something that ate other things. It did not photosynthesize. It seems to have hyphal structure, but debate continues today, and every now and then something bubbles up in terms of what the newest theory is regarding prototaxites. But, so, when you want to look at fungi in geology, I will say it's been more of a detective story with DNA because there are so few, there's such a paucity of fossils and the fossil record is just so sketchy. Um, and that's why we do tend to go back to these genome analysis techniques looking at DNA. Because decay fungi are important, but if you start to ask this question, how important are they really geologically important, economically important, important enough that they affect whether you can turn on your lights, how it is that we used to get to work uh, back when we were commuting, um, and whether you can make coffee in the morning. Um, it's, again, the story of carbon, that plants take in carbon from the atmosphere, they fix it, they turn it into sugars, cellulose and lignin, as I mentioned before. And some of this is a bit repetitive, as Tom Volgois told me, if something's important, um, don't feel bad about repeating it twice. So some of this is a little bit repetitive, but again, saying that bacteria and fungi love sugars, simple sugars, and they even love, bacteria are very good at breaking down cellulose. It's again, when you get into lignin, putting cellulose together with lignin and coming up with woody type of uh, materials, that then it becomes much more difficult to break down. And wood, I would say, is one of the most amazing things plants evolved. It's strong, it's hard to break down, and it was really a game changer. And again, repeating this, that fungi are the only organisms so far that have evolved this ability to really efficiently and um, break down large amounts of woody debris in ecosystems. So when did plants, when did this start to happen in terms of the develop, evolution of lignin? And this goes back to the late Devonian and the early Carboniferous, the coal bearing periods. Carboniferous trees had a lot of lignin in them, especially in the bark. And um, this was a period also of massive carbon deposition. So at this time, all of a sudden plants could be tall and they could be strong. And I say we, uh, I mean the earth, the earth finally had real trees, 
we weren't around to see them, but all of a sudden there were things that were tall other than prototaxites, whatever prototaxites is. It may have looked something like this. We've got lots of artists' conceptualizations of what the Carboniferous period looked like, but what it resulted in is a lot of coal seams and we took those coal seams and we continued to take them and we put them in railroad cars and uh, use that as an energy source today. So people have been predicting the death of coal for many years. I happen to be flipping through a National Geographic from 1975 and even in 1975, they were saying coal belongs to the past versus coal is the fuel of our future. Um, whatever you believe, and now I'm curious if I had had time, uh, if COVID hadn't eaten up quite so much of my time, um, to have updated this, this probably again goes back to late 2017 of energy.gov, that coal is the largest domestically produced source of energy in America and is used to generate a significant chunk of the nation's electricity. Love it or hate it, believe in, um, you know, it's the reality that we still use a lot of coal. And looking at just some of the general numbers, it doesn't, oh, worldwide, um, it's about 30% of global primary energy needs. It's especially used in steel production, um, generates 40% of the world's electricity, and um, together, oil, oil and natural gas still are more, but coal is a significant chunk of uh, where we get our energy. And of course, as things change, hopefully, Renewable energy sources are going to continue to expand. Um, but throughout history and through current times, the world has relied on coal as, a, as an energy source. From a human perspective, the Carboniferous was really important because of this, because fossil carbon in the form of fossil lignin, which is um, coal, this fueled the Industrial Revolution, still fuels our energy use today. And we now, of course, recognize just how problematic the use of all of these fossil fuels are as atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide um, go up and what this may uh, mean. So in a general way, way, even beyond the human effects on it, we think today in terms of carbon cycling, it's very second nature to just think that carbon is cycling that yes, carbon gets fixed by trees, but of course there are fungi breaking it down. But there was a period when it really wasn't, there are periods where we've had massive carbon deposition. And so this question of why did the earth switch from massive carbon deposition to carbon cycling? And so the first story that I'll tell on this is, well, it goes back to this idea that early on, um, the explanation for the Carboniferous period really tended to be it just happened to be an optimal time for carbon deposition, which isn't particularly helpful. It doesn't explain a lot. Um, and then followed up with, there were a lot of swamps. There, these were anaerobic conditions and this was optimal time for forming um, carbon. And when pushed a little bit harder, you often came back to that same thing of carbonous risk just happened to be an optimal time for carbon deposition. Um, then, oops, that's not what I meant to do. I meant to do this. This 2012 paper by, um, again, David Hibbett, but Igor Grigoriev at JGI, Dan Cullen, Dmitry Flautis, and others looking at genome saying um, that there was a Paleozoic origin of enzymatic lignin decomposition. So what did this all mean? Well, they were, they were looking at the genomes of fungi, and what they were saying is they were thinking why carbon cycling? Potentially, one of the answers might be fungi. They evolved, this is that they evolved this switch from carbon deposition to carbon cycling may be tied to when fungi evolved the enzymes needed to break down wood, lignified cellulose. Up until the end, until the end of the Carboniferous, fungi, the argument was, didn't really have the molecular machinery needed to deal with lignin. And it wasn't, this wasn't really a new idea. They even mentioned this goes back to, you know, in Robinson 1990, where this was hypothesized um, that this might be one of the reasons why there was so much carbon deposition during that period. Now, going out to the big picture, when I say things like the Paleozoic origin, for me, I always have to put things in perspective like this to remember 
we've got the Earth at about 4.5 billion years old, and then the beginning of you know photosynthesis at about 3.5 billion years ago it was a really long time before we got to the Paleozoic. This pale blue bar that comes after this dark blue bar. So I'm showing this really just to show that where the Paleozoic is in the broad context, the dinosaurs come after, um, but this is a period where you're starting to get the first vertebrate land animals. Um, Cambrian explosion was right before that. And if we zoom in on the Paleozoic, what you see is that plants are colonizing land between about 440 and 460 million years ago, and plants were evolving lignin, and you were getting the first trees sometime around 360 million years ago. And then based on their, evolu their analysis of the fungal genomes, they were saying that fungi evolved mechanisms to break down lignin sometime around 300 million years ago. And what this left was a 60 million year gap that happens to coincide with the Carboniferous period. So it's a great narrative if you're a mycologist who likes to spin the stories of how important fungi are and that if we, if fungi hadn't sort of cracked the code, where would we be today? That there's this constant battle between plants and fungi and that lignin was a game changer and it took fungi a while, but they cracked the code. That was the narrative. If they hadn't, we'd be buried in all of this wood and plant material that wouldn't be cycling. Um, and that fungi were the biological switch that flipped the earth from massive carbon accumulation to carbon cycling. And then I have to say, does then every good narrative deserves a counterpoint. So it sounds great. It's all of course based on observation and correlation. And does, does everyone agree with this narrative? Uh, the answer is no. Matt Nelson, I don't know if you're out there listening, but um, this was the original paper that I was talking about by uh, Dimitri Plautis and David Hibbett at all in 2012 versus Another paper um, that came out in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2016 saying delayed fungal evolution did not cause the Paleozoic peak in coal production with um, Matt Nelson and others, uh, Kevin Boyce, and telling a very different story, telling a very different narrative. So in a, a quick summary, um, I'll just go through and say that their sort of story was that coal production has been produced at later periods when decomposing fungi existed. Um, the counterpoint that I, to that that I've heard, my counterpoints are in, are in gold here. True, but not in the amounts observed during the Carboniferous. That's the argument, that's the counter argument I've heard to that. Mechanisms for lignin degradation existed before the Paleozoic. So in the, you know, they're trying to say, fungi have been degrading lignin for a long time. And the Carboniferous wasn't all about the fact that fungi didn't have the enzymes because those enzymes already existed. This, I would say, I actually, I think this is maybe the biggest weakness from my standpoint of how I view the evolution of decay mechanisms, because I would say that this is technically true, but what existed at the time before the Paleozoic in in my opinion, based on the lineages that seem to have been present, Dacromycetales, those kind of things, were not really known as major wood decomposers. Things were beginning to experiment with the ability to break down wood. They were starting to get some of the enzymes in place. But I would, I would argue most of the lineages known at that time were not known to be really strong wood decomposing fungi. They also in this paper argue that plant input, the amount coming in changed over time, but the amount of coal deposited didn't. Um, that I haven't heard any response to. So I don't know much about that. And another um, argument in the paper is that if carbon wasn't being cycled during the Carboniferous, it would have pulled in all of the carbon out of the atmosphere entirely. This I've heard pretty much it comes down to the simple explanation is, uh, those calculations are, <laughs> are extremely complicated. Um, and that nobody said no decay was happening at this time. So uh, trying to come up with those calculations of whether or not, um, you know, and trying to take into account that if decay was ramping up during that time, how much, uh, if it was the beginning of carbon cycling, that this calculation that all of the carbon would have been pulled out of the atmosphere um, is using some of potentially the most extreme variables.
but hopefully this will um, get uh, Matt Nelson to then agree to give a, a counterpoint lecture um, sometime at one of your uh, to be determined slots. But overall, I would say what they summarized in this paper was they were saying that peak coal formation was caused by a coincidence of things. Again, going to this, the perfect conditions were perfect. Swamp conditions over large areas and the continental plates were just in the right place at the right time. They weren't plunging too deeply so that you could make carb coal and all of a sudden it would just be plunged deep into the earth's mantle and gone forever, um, nor eroding too quickly to produce coal and then have it erode. And that most of the geological evidence points to the fact that fungi wouldn't have to have been involved, but it was simply was this confluence of events during this time period that is why we have this period of massive carbon deposition. So my take home, these are my 100% personal take home messages, is that people get really invested into their narratives. And that to this day, I see people um, at meetings argue very strongly <laughs> and very animatedly one way or another um, regarding uh, these two works and other commentaries that have come out since then. And my take is that until we can travel in time, produce multiple Earths so that we could good replicates for experimentation. Understanding deep geological history, it tends to be a narrative. It's based on observation and correlation. And it's okay to have multiple competing hypotheses and think about all of the different possibilities. Um, so at least when I've tried to present this to my students, say there's different, you know, it, this is not a bad thing that uh, people necessarily disagree. And if I was going to be a real someone to fall in the middle, I'd say it's probably a mixture of things, the right environmental conditions, the right tectonic conditions, and some lag time that's hard to ignore in the evolutionary race between fungi and plants in lignin with this 40 to 60 million gap, year gap where it looks like the evolution of the enzymes needed to really efficiently break down large amounts of wood, um, that there was potentially this, this lag there that uh, has this interesting narrative for those of us who love fungi, say that fungi can truly affect not only present day processes, but go back and um, also affect deep geological history. So I want to leave you all with just this idea that when you're out in the woods, once you can finally go back out in the woods, both because of um, once restrictions are lifted, as well as once conditions are a little bit better uh, and warmer. So we're getting some warmer days here and you start to see foliotas coming out on logs and you see wood decomposition happening. In the back of your mind, you can think about that as, is that going to be future coal? Where are we currently in terms of carbon sequestration and this link between wood decay fungi and lignin and potentially this thing, fossilized lignin that we, that we call coal and have used as an energy source for a long time that fueled the industrial revolution, electrification of, North Amer of many places and this, the insane amounts of electricity um, that we use today. So with that, I'm going back out. And so that's the end of my PowerPoint. So now it's time for questions. Okay, Charles had muted himself, so ask your question, Charles. <laughs> All right, which I had a great question, but uh, no, it's a wonderful lecture and uh, fascinating about the idea of the lignin decomposing fungi. And so you're saying that based on the DNA evidence, these lignin decomposing fungi only arrived uh, 60 million years after the Carboniferous period? That at about the end of it, and um, yes, and there's arguments about which enzymes you're looking at, but in terms of the major white rot and brown rot decomposition pathways, um, again, and molecular clocks are tricky things. So the, the flautus et al based on 31 genomes and we get more and more um, genomes each day and that helps with, the anal with, with trying to estimate these things. Um, yeah, based on their analysis, it looked like sort of woody trees came on the scene and it was 40 to 60 million years before wood decay fungi 
were there to do much about it. Well, I have an interest in using lignin in industrial processes. And so I'm very curious about the types of enzymes that are uh, currently known that can do this function. Uh, is there a reference you can point me to? I can, if you can message me, that's about a semester long sure. series <laughs> on yeah, all of the different it. types of white rot and brown rot. And they're all, it's, yeah, it, that's an amazing area to look into, especially some of these ones that do it under extreme circumstances. Um, so happy to talk more about that. I apologize for any, I, that, that's why I started tr showing up, trying to show, I, I hoped it wasn't too uh, uh, beyond uh, the average person who just wants to, who loves mushrooms, um, but get people thinking about, you know, that fungi are connected to these, uh, these processes that are happening today in terms of potential climate change, as well as these things that we saw in the past. And for people who really want to drill down into some of the mechanisms of the enzymes used, um, that's, I'm stationed here at Forest Products Lab. That's what we do all, all day long. And so excited to talk to people about it because we also, one of the reasons that I'm still here is we maintain a culture collection of about 30,000 different fungi, most of them wood decomposing fungi. Um, and we work with a variety of partners for trying to figure out pharmaceutical uses, biotech uses, how to make vegan leather from mycelium, um, you name it. Yeah, I know FPL is particularly famous for some of their work early on in the um, thickening agent. It was created the, uh, out of cabbage. How did I think they were, oh, that's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if they've been involved in everything from creating, yes. uh, you know, modern building materials, good and bad, as well as the next generation of modern building materials, as well as everything down to how can you create a, a stamp, a postage stamp that you don't have to lick, which in this day and age is now all of a sudden, when they first came out, I was like, this is horrible. A sticker instead of a stamp, you don't have to lick it. And now... Um, Everybody is thrilled to not have to send saliva through the mail. But how do you develop an adhesive on a postage stamp that works at minus 40 all the way up to 120 degrees and is recyclable? Um, so projects, uh, yeah, Forest Products Lab is an amazing place and we've been lucky that we have a mycology unit embedded within it. Um, as much as we're also sort of part of the Northern Research Station going back and actually our unit in terms of why does the Forest Service care about fungi goes back to um, uh, Hen, uh, von Schrank, Herman von Schrank actually goes back to the uh, 1898 in terms of when our mycology unit was started and it all had to do with at the time decomposition of railroad ties and the fight for the lumber barons of destroying forests um, that they were cutting down millions of trees to for the railroads with no concept of wood preservation and how could you keep fungi out through world war ii it was still kind of this narrative as fungi as the 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 bad guy and then especially through world war ii and later it was not just smoky and only you can present prevent forest fires but the narrative was that you can prevent forest fungi and forest fungi are are the bad guys and then through the 70s and 80s, the ecological appreciation of what fungi do in terms of decomposition, how they provide wildlife habitat for woodpeckers, um, and, and on and on. Okay, well then, Susan, go ahead. You said that about 10% of the rotters are brown rot rather than white rot. Is that North America only or worldwide as far as we know? That is based on some really broad lists of species mostly based on North America. Most of the brown rots tend to be concentrated in the Northern Hemisphere, in, um, into the boreal zone, the, and nobody knows quite why. And some of the, uh, there's a bunch of different ideas of, of why that may be. But what I'll say is it's misleading. Even though only 10% of species may be brown rots. That means from an evolutionary standpoint, it didn't happen as much, but you can go um, into certain ecosystems in the West, 
say, Western United States, uh, in Idaho, some of the systems we work in, and I would say 90% of the carbon is flowing through probably brown rot pathways. Brown rot fungi dominate some areas. So it's kind of like when people ask, how many poisonous fungi are there? And you say, well, about 5% are really poisonous and 5% are really good edibles and everything else falls in between. But then there's, you can go into a particular forest and 95% of the, if all of a sudden Amanita Biosperiger group or uh, death caps or those are fruiting, all of a sudden those can make up 90% of what you see. So even though from an, that's more from an evolutionary standpoint that only about 10% of what the decay species are brown rot, but in some systems, brown rot is exceptionally important. I, I just wanted to, first of all, great speech. Thank you for that. And then I wanted to ask, like, what are the next steps for research? For me, the next steps, if when I, so I, in 2006 and 2007, as working for the Forest Service, we tend to, um, that we strive to do work that can really be used by managers and on the ground and, um, I was trained to do wood decomposition of fungi as a PhD, and that was my background was, and then white nose syndrome of bats came along. And I've spent a great deal of time um, working with trying to figure out management strategies and detection techniques for the fungus that causes white nose syndrome of bats. Um, I have that work, I'm finally getting some of my time back to devote to this. And I would say some of the places where I would really love to go are what we have no information on right now is how in all of these different ecosystems um, how much carbon is flowing into white rot versus brown rot and trying to come up with a way with a distributed network of um, really awesome amateurs and professionals and just devoted people out there come up with a kit so that you could go with in about a two to three hour way possibly you would need a, a cordless drill to take samples from a variety of wood in your area um, and get a standardized sampling scheme because we asked, in order to model this globally, what it, where I would really love to go is to be able to model, to know first how much carbon is flowing into white rot and headed back to the atmosphere versus brown rot. And then tweak that and see what happens if temperature changes two degrees one way or the other and do some of the experiments. Um, so run the different models, but in order to do that, you need data from dispersed sites across all of the biomes of the world. We'd like to start with North America and then move out from there globally if in a perfect world, if I had all the funding and time um, to get these baseline data of in your neck of the woods, um, how much uh, brown rot is there versus how much white rot is there and then be able to feed that into models to see what happens if you manage forests in different ways. Can you manage for brown rots in particular situations and even potentially manage for them as native species that we may have lost um, to help promote carbon sequestration naturally um, or just also model it under changing different changing climate scenarios. Daniel asks, how long does a typical log in a forest take to decay due to fungi in our region? In our region. Oh, they specified it with our region because I was about to say it matters where you are and it matters very much on the tree species and then the size of the tree. So something like a hemlock, um, which is, or say a white cedar can be extremely resistant to decay. Um, uh, a large, Old growth hemlock could be in the range of 400 years. Uh, sugar maple, even though it was old growth, may have been more like 150 years, even though it was quite large, say 80 centimeters in, in diameter, a pretty big tree. Um, for, I, I hate to say typical because it's all about moisture, as we know sort of from fungal problems in houses and everywhere else, it's all about access to moisture. So microclimate, it's really driven by temperature and moisture the more moisture and the warmer the temperature, generally the faster the decomposition. Um, we have put out a network of logs at at least seven different sites. And I'm trying to think by year seven, we put out both conifers and um, these were isotopically labeled logs and we put them out as conifers and hardwoods. 
in South Carolina, by year seven, there's nothing left to measure. Even the pine logs are gone. Um, in the cold subalpine sites that we have, or the, the drier um, Mediterranean climates, after seven years, um, you're looking at 5% mass loss. Um, in our general area, I would say we're, we're somewhere in between, um, that after that our, our the, the hardwoods weren't huge, they tended to be birch and aspen, um, and after seven years, they're, they're pretty far gone, while the pine after seven years is still, re which again, those were only about that large. As trees got older, they had more heartwood, and the heartwood was more resistant to decay, so younger trees um, that don't get as old with less um, heartwood are going to decompose faster. And I apologize for not giving you a specific number. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, I know that a lot of commonly cultivated mushroom species are white rotters. And being a cultivator and someone who cares about um, doing a little bit to mitigate climate change. I'm wondering if there are any brown rotter um, mushroom species that could be worthwhile cultivating. That is an awesome question. People, the thing that jumps to mind that's really hard to cultivate and I, is, well, chicken of the woods or, um, you know, Latiporus sulfurius is one that is sometimes cultivated, but it's really difficult to cultivate. It tends to be, even in log cultivation, hit or miss. Early on, I was also concerned about that because it was being shipped across North America. And I would, I would always say one of my pet peeves or things that I always go back to is try and go with local strains if you can. Um, because uh, we often have un unknown species. And so Patrick or Brooke, someone else out there with a good idea of what do we or could we cultivate that's a good brown rot. Um, we use, Pomatopsis panicola, oddly, is being collected more, maybe not cultivated, but being grown for extracts like Ganodermas, for teas. Um, Piptoporus betulinus is a common brown rot in our area, although I don't know, again, that that's used for much of anything. What, what makes the chicken mushroom hard to cultivate? It... Um, it does not do well on sawdust media. It tends to, it loves to produce, it seems to need large contiguous columns of decay. And if you try and grow it on, um, it can like, if you drill, if you kind of use like a shiitake technique, it can work. Um, if you do the sandwich of a big log, inoculum, another big log, um, and wrap it in plastic, that tends to work. Um, most of the sawdust cultivation, it grows on each piece individually and produces conidia like mad, but tends n is very difficult to get it to produce fruiting bodies um, under those situations. If other people have had more luck, it's one again that they'll sell you in almost all the, in a bunch of different places so that you can inoculate with it. Um, but I don't, it's not one that I hear a lot of raving success stories about just how well it worked combined with the fact that there are some people who have sensitivities to it. Um, but that's the, see, let's see. Ganoderma, yeah, unfortunately, Ganoderma tacea is almost, is all white rot. Um, so the Antrodia clade, Gliophyllum, even for the agarics, I'm trying to think if there's an agaric, that's a great question that I'm gonna think on to try and think about what are ones that could, because as we come up with this sort of mushroom compost after you've grown your fungi, it would be nice like biochar and other things to be able to say, um, in addition to growing mushrooms, you're producing something that you can incorporate into the soil and it makes really nice long, you know, long lived carbon. Uh, Foliot is white rot, so is Ganoderma. Yeah. The postias, the oligoporus, nobody eats those. Those are the brown rots. Um, I'm stumped. No pun intended. <laughs> pun kind of intended. Uh, can I ask a question about um, Daldinia? And you mentioned endophytes. 
Yes. So some people that are doing like shiitake logs or inoculating wood sometimes get daldinia show up instead. Can you explain how endophytes work? Endophytes are, oh, I wish I could explain how endophytes work. Um, endophytes are incredibly complicated. Uh, they are fungi that are in the tree while the tree is still alive. What we've, we've been trying to track how many of those endophytes, how much turnover there is in the endophyte community. Um, and what it comes down to is sort of Lynn, Lynn Body and Alan Rayner's original work in the UK that I agree with and don't agree with and that they, they came up with this paradigm that everything was colonized before, before the tree died. And Lynn actually has this beautiful paper, well, it's a beautiful title, um, that uh, trees carry the seeds of their own destruction with this idea that they have endophytic fungi in them that include decay fungi and all sorts of things. And so that even if you cut a living oak and you're so happy that it's living and it's perfect and you're going to inoculate it for shiitake, it is filled with endophytic fungi, potentially things like uh, daldinia uh, that are going to compete with your shiitake, which is why you try and keep it as fresh as possible. You hit it with as much inoculum as possible and you try and make conditions right so that um, the, the shiitake can win. Um, but some of these other endophytic fungi, it's really, really hard to get rid to fight what's there. We've tried a bunch of different inoculation experiments in different places and often the, if you don't use massive amounts of inoculation, the either the resident community within the log or whatever is coming in from the outside overwhelms it and, and takes over. And a quick question, okay, from Hunter Griffla Frondosa, I have, so the um, hen of the woods, that is really an interesting question because the early, early evident, the short answer is Griffla is almost certainly a white rot, but based on some mixed up tubes in the very first analyses and still in some of the analyses, Griffla is weird and based on its DNA, it often falls out in or close to the brown rot clades, even though it's probably not a brown rot. And so it's either a white rot in a brown rot clade or we just haven't looked at enough genes and it probably is off on its own on a long branch and for some reason keeps getting grouped in with these brown rots. So there were some people early on who have thought that uh, Hen of the Woods was a brown rot, but it's a white rot. Fistulina hepatica, brown rot, woohoo! Um, Beefsteak fungus, yeah, so that would be, and uh, heart, is, have people grown that very successfully? Um, but, oh, Matt. Hey, Dan, how you doing? <laughs> Good, how are you? Good, it's great you. to hear from you. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks for presenting multiple sides of, of the argument. I, I uh, hope you don't mind. I just wanted to add a couple additional points. Um, Please do. One of the, the points that, that, that Kevin Boyce and colleagues and I were, were trying to make was that also, it's not really a lignin argument. So one of the, if you look at one of the most kind of like abundant inputs to coal, it ended up being the paraderm. So kind of like the bark-like uh, substance of these lycopsids. So the relatives of uh, Huperzia and Lycopodium. Hmm. And work Kevin Boyce has done is actually showed that there isn't really, there doesn't seem to be any evidence of lignin in all that bark. It looks like it's much more consistent with subarin. So one of the points we're trying to make is that like there's a huge amount of this carboniferous coal where the, the input seems to not be lignified plant material. Um, so that was, yeah, kind of an additional point. Um, well, that we were and that's to make. great. As you say, lignin sticks around. If there's truly a bunch of subarin, these bark, especially for some of the species at that time had massive amounts of bark. And so when we tend to focus on wood, it would, yeah. I think we need, you'd have to know way more about bark. And I do, and so I apologize because this, this presentation was first put together going back to when the Hibbit paper came out, Hibbit et al, um, updated after your work <laughs> that I appreciate so much. Um, and in a perfect world, what I was hoping to do was like to dive into it for a day or two and really come up with some updates. And I'm so thrilled 
that you're on the line because um, I know there's a lot of those last two slides. I really glossed over a lot of things. I appreciate you including it and everything. And yeah, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to kind of add that in there and yeah, I, I appreciate you in, including us in there. Are you still following up on that work? So I am a bit, but not as much as I was at the time. Um, okay. Yeah, I've been seeing some cool papers coming out, finding bacteria involved in lignin degradation. Mm. So there's like a 2019 paper in ISMI. Mm. Um, and there's been some other cool um, work done uh, in PNAS by um, blanking on the name right now. But they were trying to do ancestral state reconstructions of the actual proteins, like the peroxidase proteins themselves, and trying to think about what would their functional capacity have been. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of cool work to come. Um, yeah, it's an exciting topic for sure. <laughs> Thank you. And, yep, exciting topic. And for me that I have to admit my, where I want to go with it is I would love this, just where are we headed in the future? Being able to map and model um, sort of carbon dynamics based on different scenarios um, with really what just shocks me is the absolute lack of information for any ecosystem of a good map of uh, how much is really headed down one direction versus the other. We, yeah. We treat it all as sort of a big black box in these models. Right. Well, thank you, Dan. <laughs> Take care. I'm glad you're out there. Any more questions, thoughts? Well, then I guess we're finished, perhaps. Other <laughs> than we're all going to have to get on fistulina hepatica production. <laughs> altering. But I very much appreciate, Dan, your flexibility and willingness to join us tonight. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, everyone, for joining.